Hi there, Rene Rubokava with Odonet. And today I just wanted to go over how to build a Dojo widget uh, for your ArcGIS JavaScript applications, or just in Dojo in general. Uh, so to build a, a Dojo widget, you're most likely going to end up using the Digit widget base. And if you're not familiar with the Digit library, it's basically the UI library that uh, is provided with to help you build um, Dojo widgets. Uh, Dojo also comes with this declare module under Dojo base declare and declare kind of helps you build um, JavaScript uh, applications in a uh, kind of a classy manner. They're, these aren't really classes in the typical sense you might be thinking of but they look a little more familiar. We can see that there's a uh, constructor in here and a few other uh, lifecycle methods. Uh, so first I just wanted to go over some of the things that happen when you build a widget and when you're going to do that you're going to use the declare method and you're going to pass an array of any other widgets that this widget will extend for example or it's going to inherit from a typical uh, inheritance and in this case we're going to uh, inherit the widget base um, you can also uh, have a templated mixin which I'll talk about in a second and any other mixins and a mixin essentially is uh, something that you can use in a widget that just provides some basic functionality. So the templated mixin, it allows you to do um, bring in HTML templates and use them in your widget. Uh, so the first thing that's going to happen when you declare a, a widget is going to be the constructor. This is the initializer. This is what happens when you do something like uh, var widget equals new widget. And in that initializer, you can pass in any options for your widget. So, for example, if I pass in an object that has uh, the map and maybe some lat longs in it, uh, it will inherit whatever those properties are into the widget. Um, you, you'll probably use this to set up any default parameters in your widget. If you're not going to set up default parameters, you could probably skip even having to worry about a constructor. Um, now, post mixin properties, and when you're working with post mixin properties, this is when the widget is almost ready to be built. Um, it's not rendered on the screen and the DOM elements um, are probably not uh, fully created, but all the properties are inherited into the widget at this point. So you can uh, go ahead and you can, uh, start working with um, you know, changing uh, a few things here and there. I hardly ever use the post mixin properties. Um, it, it probably comes in handy every now and then. Uh, and then with the build rendering, this particular uh, property is handled in most cases by the digit templated mixin. And in the templated mixin, um, it's going to go ahead and adjust any sort of. Uh, oh, excuse me. It's going to assign any properties uh, here that may need to be bound to the DOM element. Um, and this is where the, the DOM elements get created, but it's not done just yet. Uh, that happens after the put, well, just before the post create method. So when you're in the post create method here, uh, the DOM elements that comprise the widget are built. They're ready to be added to the page, but they're not necessarily on the page yet. And this is where you might hook in any. Uh, event listeners, uh, maybe you want to add extra DOM elements to your widget, maybe you're going to add other widgets to this widget. Um, this this post create uh, method might be a good place to do that. Uh, another good place to do a lot of initialization stuff will be in the startup uh, method. And the startup method is called when the DOM elements are actually built. Now this is something you would actually call on the widget yourself. So the constructor, the post mixin properties, and the build rendering, you're never actually going to call these methods. You would say uh, something like var widget equals new widget. And in that process, the constructor is going to happen, post mixin properties will happen, and build rendering will happen, and post create will happen. And you can then at some point say start up on your widget and do some sort of initialization in here. And this is a good spot to do any uh, style lookups, um, as I mentioned before, um, you probably wouldn't do any event listeners at this point. I mean, you could, but it's probably best to do that in the post create. 
But if you're building a widget that uses a map in your ArcGIS JavaScript application, you might want to make sure that the map is ready to be worked with and do any sort of hooking into the map that you want to do. Uh, the destroy method, well, as I put in here, this works as advertised. And basically, you would uh, call this method to destroy the widget. And it's going to destroy any other widgets that might be uh, in this particular widget of yours. And that, and that happens if you use something like templated mixin and um, widgets and templated mixin. And uh, widgets were getting created at some point during the um, startup hooks for the widget. And it'll go and handle destroying those. You probably won't have to call that yourself. It'll probably handle... Uh, that for you but if you say created uh, or added a widget to this widget in the startup method and it's uh, you know you said var new widget equals new widget and you add that as an element to this widget at that point you're probably going to want to destroy it you might want to have to add a, a hook in here like I said you're hardly ever probably going to use this uh, the ones you'll probably end up using the most are going to be uh, constructor to set your default parameters, uh, post create to do any event hookups, and startup to kind of initialize your widget. Those are the most popular uh, methods to probably end up using uh, when you're building a Dojo widget. Okay, so I just kind of want to show an example of how to build a custom widget for your ArcGIS JavaScript applications. And in this example, I'm going to build a legend widget, uh, table of contents widget, and the point here is that you can show the legend for the map services being used in your application, and you'll be able to turn each of those services on and off, and you could also turn off the sublayers that are part of each service on and off, which is a little trickier to do, but it can be done. It's no problem there. Uh, I'm bringing in quite a few different little modules in here just to work with the DOM and um, parsing some data. I've also got a couple of uh, little helper methods here. I've got this label name, which is going to just going to pull out a name that's going to be displayed next to the symbology for the service and the different layers. And I'm using declare here to go ahead and extend widget base, templated mixin, and the evented module. Um, templated mixin, as I mentioned before, lets me use a uh, HTML template as part of my widget. This will be the the base for the widget. And that's just a very simple couple of divs that are going to be used to hold all this information here. Uh, the evented module is going to let me um, emit events from this widget. And that's not really uh, uh, particular to this particular widget here. You don't have to worry about that too much. And as we talked about before, I'm using the post create widget. Um, and the post create widget, I know that my DOM elements are going to be used for this widget are created and they're ready. So this dot DOM node is an actual DOM element that's ready to be used. And that's really what my, my concern was. So that's why I hooked into the post create method here. So in this case I'm going to grab the uh, DOM element with an ID of map root. And this is a container that's in the ArcGIS JavaScript API's map um, element itself. And it would be called uh, map div if I name the div for the map map div it's just going to be the ID underscore root for the map so I'm grabbing that element and I'm going to place the legend in there I'm going to get the map and get the layer IDs that were passed to this particular widget and I mentioned before that any properties that you pass to the widget when you initialize it the widgets going to uh, inherit those properties so that's where um, map and layer IDs come from. You would use this.get to get those properties. And that's a standard way of doing it. And we have talk layers here, which is going to be the layer IDs that are in the map that match the layer IDs that I pass to the widget itself. And this just let me quickly find um, the layer IDs that I want to use that are part of the legend. So that's what this little method here does. And then I'm going to map over those uh, layers that match the layer IDs and I'm going to start creating some DOM elements here. I'm going to create a check mark that's going to show whether or not the uh, layer or the layer item is visible and I'm going to have a, a couple of divs here that are going to hold items and I have a um, header that's just going to hold the name for the service and then we get down in here where I'm going to create a couple more check marks and I'm basically just going to give a couple of uh, data attributes 
to these DOM elements just so I can refer to them later on. And that's what the, this method does here. And then I'm going to get the details um, for this by just using this, this get details method, which I'll show in a second here. And we have the couple of handlers here that are going to handle what happens when a check mark gets clicked. So the layer handle is going to handle what happens when the check mark for the entire service gets clicked, and item handle for what happens when a sublayer item uh, gets clicked. And it's going to just uh, turn them on or off or toggle the visibility. Uh, for the item handle, what's going to happen is it's going to go through and it's going to find uh, the index of the item that was clicked. So if it's one, two, or three, it's going to find then the visible layers. If it exists in the visible layers for that layer, it's going to remove it. And if it doesn't, it's going to add it. And then we're going to reset the visible layers down here, the layer.setVisibleLayers. So that's how that works. And the get details method just checks to make sure if a URL uh, exists as part of the layer. So maybe it was a, um, you know, just a little bit of error handling here. And then we're going to get the legend. And you do that by pass by appending slash legend at the end of the map service URL. And this get layers method is just a, a separate module I have that wraps Esri request and kind of simplifies the, the return values a little bit. Nothing too much going on there. And when I get the response back for the legend data, I'm just going to build a table that's going to display this legend information. And the table is easy to do. Uh, I liked it because I can show the check mark for each item in one column. I can show symbology in another column. And I can show the label for the symbology in another column. And that's what this does here. It's going to format my table, add the items for the legend, and make it look real nice and snazzy for me. And that's essentially it. So let's go ahead and see what that might look like. Let me refresh the page here for you. So if I drill down here, let's get down to a uh, nice little area over here. So you can see we've got all these uh, census uh, information in here. And I can turn these on and off. And I can turn off the state boundaries and other values. And that's essentially it. I can turn off the entire service if I wanted to. And that's the basics of how to build a legend table of contents. At the moment, this particular widget only handles dynamic map service layers. Uh, you can have it work with feature layers. And if you want to put in the extra work, you can also have it work with um, feature layers that have custom rendering applied to them. That's a little bit trickier, um, but it can be done. Um, so that's something I'll go over. I'll leave that as an exercise up to you. Or if you have questions about how you might accomplish that, please feel free to let me know. And thank you for watching.